Okay, the webinar is now live. <clears throat> So you want to move number two to number six? Ben? Yes, I'd move number two. Um, I, I just put it as the last item, yeah. Okay. Are you ready, Terry? Yes. Okay. All righty. Uh, I'd like to open the meeting. I need a motion to adopt the agenda with the uh, condition of moving the first item to fifth item and just putting everybody up one. Okay, I'll move approval of the agenda with item number two last on our list. Second. Second. I got Director Kohler a second. Do you want to do a duo? <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> um, Director Bragman? Aye. Director Gibson? Aye. Director Kohler? Aye. Director Schmidt? Aye. And Chair Russell? Aye. Okay, any public comment on items not on the agenda? No, there are no comments. Okay. <clears throat> All righty, then we start with item three, water system master plan update, which is now item two. Oh, I guess, hold it one second. Did hold we it. want to approve the minutes oh. first or? Minutes, yes. Can I get a motion to adopt the minutes of the last meeting? Get moved. Second. Roll call. Director Bragman? Aye. Director Gibson? Aye. Director Kohler? Aye. Director Schmidt? Aye. And Chair uh, Russell? <clears throat> Okay, this is now item two, which is labeled item three. I'm sorry, um, Director Russell, uh, just wanted to check with the clerk that there were no public comments on the minutes. There are none. Okay, thanks. So this is water system master plan update. Good morning, directors. Uh, Alicia Irish, senior engineer in the planning department. This morning, I have for you an update on the water system master plan. I'm here along with colleagues, Xavier Arias and Katie Cole, consultants from Woodard and Curran. And today we have an update on the water system master plan, which is a comprehensive evaluation of the district's complex water system infrastructure. And this water system master plan will include, will inform a long-term capital investment efforts needed to improve the water systems infrastructure. And a portion of this plan includes a focused evaluation on the Ross Valley system. This plan began in September, 2020 and will be completed in September, 2022. And thus far, the project team has identified key system challenges, evaluated planning and design criteria some of which were discussed during our last update to the board on the February 12th operations committee meeting, as well as begun assessment of the Ross Valley system, which we, we will be getting into in more detail today. This morning, wow. we have prepared a presentation for you. And next slide, please. And we'll be, we will be going over a brief background of the master plan discuss the storage quantification analysis of the Ross Valley system, including Ross Reservoir and Pine Mountain Tunnel, discuss how SQL will be integrated into this project process, present to you a preview of the storage site alternatives, go over our public engagement approach, as well as the next steps to this project. So the water system master plan, next slide please will present to you a system-wide look at service level criteria and the overall investment needs in the long-term. And like I mentioned, a portion of this plan is a focused look at the persistent issues in Ross Valley related to Pine Mountain Tunnel and the siting and sizing of storage in that area. And since the February 12th uh, operations committee meeting where we last presented to you an update of this plan. Next slide, please. 
we have finalized documentation on storage and pumping criteria, advanced geotechnical studies in the Ross Valley area with site visits, updated the Ross Valley hydraulic model with the latest consumption data to account for more recent demand patterns, as well as initiated Ross Valley and Pine Mountain Tunnel storage analysis. So this morning, we'll be getting into a focused discussion on the Ross Valley system. Next slide. And to give a reminder of where Ross Valley is located within our system, the figure on the left shows the San Geronimo treatment plant in the upper left-hand corner and Alto tanks located in Mill Valley in the lower right-hand corner. The box highlights the Ross Valley area, which serves about 23% of our customers. The red circle denotes Ross Reservoir and Pine Mountain Tunnel is located just to the left of the upper left-hand corner of this box. And now I'll be handing this presentation over to Xavier Arias to discuss the storage quantification in the Ross Valley system. Thanks, Alicia. We could go to the next slide. So uh, I, I wanted to talk about first how we quantified the storage that we need for the Ross Valley area. And you may recall from last time we talked and what Alicia just briefly covered is that we, we did look at storage and pumping criteria. And so we, we tuned them up a little bit, but the, the general concept didn't change. And it's very much in line with what other utilities do is you employ rules of thumb to, to look at how much storage do you need. These are, you know, you can come up with storage levels that generally work and you can always fine tune them or examine them. And we, we did some of that as well. But we start with a, a rule of thumb to estimate total storage. And when you think about what that total storage is, is there for, what purpose it serves, it, it's often compartmentalized into these three categories. Of course, dead storage doesn't actually serve much purpose, but it's just a, a fact of life. So kind of working from the bottom up, there is part of the tank that you in practice don't really get full advantage of because of uh, plumbing limitations. So typically you have a, a side pipe going into the tank. And even if you could access it, you could plumb from the bottom and some tanks do. But that water is often of lower quality. It tends to have uh, a little sediment in it. So it's, not, it's best practice to not pump all the way to the last gallon. Then, so moving up, um, typically the greatest share of storage it would be emergency storage for things like um, fires or major pipe breaks and so on that might interrupt supply to the tank. And then the, 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 you, of course, have great reliability because the tank typically is serving by gravity um, many of the customers so that that emergency storage comes into play. And operational storage, that's storage that you, you tend to use every day. Maybe not every winter day, but at least during the summer, it gets exercised heavily. So you, they can be examined as, as components, but generally the rule of thumb that the district has used has, has actually worked very well over the years, adequacy rating. It's a rule of thumb where you look at how much, how much storage should you have versus how much you need. And the, the, the ratio there gives you a feel for, for generally well how adequate it is you know is it is it just barely adequate or are you or do you need to add something so let's go to the next slide so we did look at it first of all starting with what was the the under the old criteria and and that dates back to the, the last time this was i think updated was 2016. so using um, the district's methodology and this this was written up in 2016 so among the information we reviewed is well what was the old basis of sizing and of course part of our scope was to take a fresh look at all of that and it would be criteria that would be applied the new criteria applied to all of the system not just ross valley so it's it, it accounts for all of the hundred and some odd pressure zones that the district has but we applied it to this particular area of ross valley so with the old criteria, the, the method is you, you look at your average summer daily consumption, that's ASDC. You, whatever that is times two is the, the rule of thumb for that's how much storage you should have. So your adequacy rating is, is the ratio of what you got versus what you, um, what you should have. So you hope to get a, a, a favorable rating there. 
we did look at um, ways that that could be adjusted so that under the new criteria, you see the formula is different. Instead of two times ASTC, it's two times ADD. ADD means average daily demand. So it's the, we took the summer part out of it. And there are reasons for that. Among other things, it's easier to, to measure. You can, so if, if you have declining demands or increasing demands, you, you, you can definitely dial into to that very easily and objectively, whether it's for a part of a zone, one zone or a set of zones, ADD is a number that we can get our arms around. But we, we, we also, of course, compared this to other utilities and so on. Is this, this in line with what, what is generally good practice and tends to work? And, and it is as long as fire flow is adequately accounted for. So you see the formula does have plus fire flows. And the, the idea there is fire flow is, um, will be met even in, in very small zones. It's, it's prudent to have fire flow. Even if your demands are fairly low, you want to make sure you can fight a fire. So that's why we, we add a little more detail there. The net result of all this is for very large zones, you need less storage. For very small zones, you need more storage. In the case of Ross Valley, it's a large zone, so your storage is actually going down with the new criteria. So you see the, the result of the formula is we take two times and it's a smaller number, 5.38, and then we add on fire flow. For a very small zone, that might be a significant number, but for Ross Valley, it doesn't make that much difference, 0.18 mg. So we end up with 10.9 million gallons. And obviously that's less than the old number of 14 million gallons. So we, that the idea there was to right size it. Um, we should remember that the system was, was put in over a period of many decades. And generally for much of that time, the rule of thumb was bigger was better. Um, so there's, as far as why did we do this? I think right sizing storage, it has its, has its own benefits. It's not simply that a smaller tank might be less expensive or easier to build. Um, you can get water quality benefits by having right-sized storage. So there's an interest in doing it for all the zones. And so this is one that we took a close look at. So I think we're ready for the next slide. So we looked at how do we meet this, uh, this required storage that, that I just showed you on the previous slide. And so we, we looked at all of the all of the storage that is at least hydraulically connected and could in theory contribute. And then we did modeling, essentially a, the equivalent of a tracer study, which you can now do with software modeling to find out which of these existing tanks could possibly contribute. And we had gotten definitely some insight from operations as to what they, what they believed and had observed over the years. And we wanted to make sure that, that the modeling results were consistent and confirmed that, which turned out they did. Um, so that there's some tanks there that are listed, Escal, Greenbrae, and, and San Clemente. Um, they're useful for other aspects of the system, but they don't really help in terms of contributing storage to this area of interest, to, to Ross Valley. So what storage does that leave? Ross Reservoir and Pine Mountain Tunnel itself. So we looked at, are there, are there options for non-structural alternatives before we jump straight to okay, we need a tank, how big does the tank have to be? Are, are there other ways to, to access some of that existing storage? And we did identify one way to get more value from one of those existing tanks. And if we look at the next slide, we'll see how that worked out. Essentially, if we, if we look at San Clemente tank, if we put in some new valves that are indicated in that figure, uh, we can effectively peel off that portion of the demand so that it's served by San Clemente tank, which has more than adequate volume for that, for that region of the service area. And by taking that demand off of the, the, basically the demand that would otherwise be served by Ross Reservoir and Pine Mountain, we take 0.55 MGD off of that average daily demand. So we go from an average daily demand, it was 5.38 for the whole Ross Valley area we can peel off 0.55, then you see, well, that brings us to 4.83. And then we plug back into the formula you saw, which is two times ADD plus fire flow, come up with a new number and that's 9.84. So, so essentially for every demand reduction, you get to, get to double the benefit. So by taking 0.55 of demand off, we, we actually took a full 1.1, um, it actually is million gallons, um, 
So we went from 10.9 million gallons required to 9.84 required. So that, that we saw is good news. So let's, let's look at the summary slide, shows how all this goes. We, we went from 14 under the old criteria. Then the, the first cut, it just, let's just apply the new criteria. We got to 10.9. And then if we make some changes in the system to access some of that existing storage, then we can go all the way down to 9.84. So the, the benefits again of right sizing, they're kind of summarized here, but it's, it can save money because smaller tanks should be less expensive, can reduce the impacts because the project is a little smaller and it can improve water quality because the, the tank is, but by being right sized, you have lower detention time in the tank. So less chance of nitrification and other concerns. So having, having kind of uh, tuned that up, we, we took a closer look at that, that, that the storage that is contributing and let's look at the next slide. So how does that, how does your status quo storage stack up versus required? Remember we need 9.84, which is rounded on this slide to 9.8. Existing storage though, unfortunately totals only four. And we have Ross Reservoir. It's a, a legacy open cut reservoir. Uh, that means it's essentially just a, a hole in the ground with a, a small dam and a roof over it. It's not really a tank. That's 1.0 million gallons. And then we have Pine Mountain Tunnel, which as you know, is not really supposed to be a tank. It's a, it's a legacy tunnel. It used to convey untreated water. And then it was converted to a de facto storage facility. So now it, it, it does function as a tank. And we, of course, we're looking at um, how much of that is effectively contributing? Uh, if, it's, if it's acting like a tank, what size tank is it acting like? And so we, we looked at detailed operational records and we looked at multiple years, but there's just an example in the lower left of the kind of records we looked at. So you, you look on a summer day, how much is it cycling? And, and you, can, you can draw bands around it, which we, we did to see what, if it were a tank, what would be its kind of low water and high water marks? And that gives us an insight into effectively how big is it? And so it's, it also of course tells you just how you're doing as a reality check on all these rules of thumb we've been talking about. So it turns out we're using 3 million gallons pretty routinely in Pine Mountain Tunnel, plus the one that we know we have in Ross Reservoir. So, we're, so we have pretty solid handle on, we, we have existing storage of four that is being heavily used. So what that means, of course, um, looking at it two different ways, you kind of get the same conclusion. First of all, it's being heavily used. So we know that it's, it, it is operational storage. Um, in, the, you know, in August, 2020, we didn't have a, a massive apocalypse or a huge emergency. This is just to meet daily conditions. It's cycling this much. So that by definition is operational storage. It's about four. And so the fact that we're using it all to meet our operational needs suggests that emergency storage is very limited. So that, that that's, serves as a little bit of a reality check on the, yeah, I think this adequacy rating based storage need of 9.8, um, I'd say the first level of confirmation is just reviewing the operating data. Um, yeah, it is suggesting that four is nowhere near enough. We looked at it one other way though, just, just to make sure that we've thoroughly scrubbed this number of, of 9.8. Let's look at the next slide. The other thing we did was we ran an extended period simulation where you can take a scenario and see how the system actually behaves um, with the storage. And you can, you can see how much storage is actually using to, to get through a particular scenario. So we looked at a 24 hour outage scenario um, among other reasons, it's just, it's one that has been used in prior studies. So we were able to see, well, how much benefit do we get from things like demand reductions that have happened over the years? That, that should in theory give you a, a lower required storage than what we have seen before. And it did, in fact, that's the good news there is that the, the, the demand for storage, when you look at the system's ability to handle this 24 hour kind of standard planning scenario where there's, the, the idea is there's a 24 hour interruption to one of your major supplies, like um, not necessarily San Geronimo having a power outage, but something goes wrong. It could be a pipe break that is connected to one of your major treatment plants. And you assume that it takes 24 hours to kind of patch that up. 
which might be optimistic, but the main thing is it's, it is a scenario. It's just one way of looking at it. And we wanna make sure that the required storage to meet that scenario should be less than or equal to uh, the storage we're planning on. Zav, this is really good. It's really important information. Can you just maybe the pace and pick it up a bit? Sure, yeah, I think we're, we're almost done here. So. so in summary, if we go to the next slide here. So looking at it a bunch of different ways, we come up with 9.84 is in fact the minimum storage. Uh, something that I didn't spend a lot of time on, on presenting the modeling results for, but we did model a very important point, which is how much of that has to be at this kind of upper band, which is currently occupied by Pine Mountain Tunnel. And I think if there's good news there, only 1 million gallons has to be at that upper elevation. The rest can be distributed between the Ross Reservoir area and the Pine Mountain uh, elevation band. Uh, 4.0 million gallons, not, not adequate. So as we, as we look at options to decommission Pine Mountain Tunnel and replace the existing Ross Reservoir, both of those are on the to-do list for their own set of reasons, even if they weren't undersized. So we should be looking to increase storage to at least the minimum levels there, targeting 9.8 million gallons. So I, I think the, the next topics should go a little bit faster. So I, I wanted to talk about, next slide. Um, since we've been, we've been on this track of engineering studies, how might that integrate with CEQA? Because normally after you figure it out or you're starting to figure out what, are, what do we need to build, um, at some point you, you, have, you, you will have something that is a, a, a project and then you have to think about, well, if it's a project under CEQA, there are different requirements. Um, one thing I wanted to just point out is right now we're doing a sizing analysis. So we're recommending a general course of action, which is, yeah, we need storage um, and this is how much, but we're, we're not yet at the point where we would say we have a, a, a CEQA ready project that will come at, at some, some point down the road. That would be when we have a, a specific um, site and a size and we say this is a project for your consideration. So just pointing out that, that the, the, the idea is these, these studies here will inform that future CEQA work, but we're not quite ready to launch that yet. We are looking at a variety of sites that, that would be um, possibilities for providing the storage, both at the Pine Mountain elevation and down at the Ross Reservoir elevation. These are the general criteria that we are, are examining those sites, just to thinking about the operational versatility of, of a given site. You know, does it, um, does it have the ability, say, to feed the, the system in a flexible way, feeding multiple zones? Does it have value for things like um, abating wildfire threats within the watershed? Um, constructability and engineering concerns, kind of the middle area there. And of course, environmental impacts, what would be the, the short and long term? Knowing that those would be examined in more detail when you get to the formal CEQA phase, but you can still think about them and it, it, it might inform whether you do a little more detailed study of a site. So I wanted to give you just a preview of where we are with the siting studies. Next slide. We did identify a couple of what I'm calling new sites. I, I think that staff is probably, they've thought about, well, is, is there a possibility along this road called Concrete Pipe Road that's within the watershed? It's it has some obvious advantages if, it, if those sites could work because it's very close to a pipe, it could be connected. And so it's, we think it's worth further inquiry. The first screening is they look technically suitable and possibly fewer and lesser impacts in a lot of, of areas. So where we are with those though, is they do need to be vetted from a geotechnical point of view. So we're working on that right now. Those studies are, they're being scoped out. And the idea is sometime this summer, probably late this summer, we would be doing actual field work on those two new sites to bring our level of knowledge on those kind of up to par with some of the other sites that have been studied for a longer period of time. So the, the next slide, this just gives you kind of a roundup of all the sites. So of course, existing sites like Ross Reservoir, looking at ways we could use that efficiently. And then some other sites that I think are probably familiar from, from prior studies, in some cases going back many years, the so-called actually kind of mislabeled Five Corners site, just kind of reading across. We looked at a site near the Bon Tempe treatment plant, one that's along Shaver Grade, Upper Cannon Village, uh, a site that was looked at 
um, decades ago, White's Hill, also I think called Blueberry, and then these two new sites I talked about. So that's where we are. We're taking a look at those. Um, I wanted to talk about our thoughts for, for public engagement. I mentioned that CEQA um, has not yet launched, but our, our suggestion would be that, that we could think about outreach that could occur prior to a formal CEQA process, which might be something like a CEQA could be, you know, posting either a notice of exemption or a notice of preparation, depending on which branch you're going. But I think before that, um, our, our, our idea is that we would be working um, with district staff and think about a, a strategy for communicating with the public about the, the need for storage and some of our ideas to, to fulfill those needs and think about lo local organizations with an interest uh, and it, it's basically stakeholder organizations that we could work with and partner to make sure that we get, get really good public engagement on this. And, and then when CEQA does come along, we could leverage that process. Of course, it has things like scoping meetings and in some cases, public comments, depending on what we're doing. So I, I think we can, we can try to harmonize the, our outreach with the CEQA process. I think we're ready for kind of a summary of what we plan to do next. Thanks, Av. So now just to quickly go over our next steps, um, we're going to perform some field geotechnical studies and some field borings for those new sites that Zoff mentioned along Concrete Pipe Road. And those results will then be integrated into the site evaluation. From there, we'll be able to identify viable options to carry forward into the CEQA process and begin our public outreach strategy. Concurrently with CEQA, we'll be initiating preliminary design to support our CEQA effort. And like I mentioned, this uh, Ross Valley is a portion of the water system master plan. So while this is going on, the other steps of the water system master plan will also be taking place that include a more uh, system-wide evaluation of our service area. That brings us to the end of our presentation today. Uh, thank you for joining. Any, I guess now we'll take any questions. Yeah, I have several questions. Okay, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Larry, it's okay. Um, just on, on CP5 and CP18, are those um, on the sort of, <laughs> As you're going up uh, Bolinas Fairfax, is that on the right side of the road? And as so you're going uphill um, from Fairfax, no, you, you take a left turn onto Concrete Pipe Road. Okay. And okay. and then it's on the it's on the as you go along Concrete Pipe Road, which kind of um, zigzags along, it's on the upslope side. So both okay. of those candidate sites are on the okay. upslope. Okay. Okay. And. Um, I assume the Ross Valley site is still, I don't know if the word targeted, but favored as far as location, or are all these sites being sort of evaluated neutrally? Well, I, I think we're, we're evaluating them all neutrally, but given that we have an existing site and while there were geotechnical concerns, as you know, landslide, et cetera, given that that's been repaired and now it's a fairly thoroughly studied site, it's already an impacted site. It, it, it certainly, it looks like we're taking a close look at um, replacing the 1.0 million gallons with something more. Right, okay. Okay, what, well, what I mean, the plan but, but, sounds reasonable. I just, you know, I think the community outreach piece is really important <laughs> because that's a very heavily used part of the watershed. But, uh, you know, concrete pipe, that area, I think sounds very favorable, really. So that's okay. it for me. <laughs> I yeah, just don't, don't, kept in the loop. Don't worry about the public engagement uh, side. That will be actively uh, engaged. Um, <laughs> I'd like to compliment you on your office uh, stuff. It's a quite pretty background picture there. Thank you. Um, I'm not aware of us ever having nitrification problems in the tanks. I might be out of touch on that one, but I don't think so. So I'm not sure that there's any real water quality benefits. Uh, the last thing is, well, uh, two things. Um, I think it's a little misleading to present sites without their elevation shown. 
because they're not apples and apples. You know, it's, uh, I mean, one of the disadvantages of the raw site overall is it's lower than Pine Mountain. Huh? So at least I think that's the case. So it's a little tricky when you say you looked at alternative sites, but they really aren't all alternative. Uh, the Blueberry Ridge tank site is much higher than the other ones that you talked about. The other thing is um, you didn't mention surge in uh, Pine Mountain. Uh, I recall that being one of the dominant things that it does um, is it gives us the ability to cycle the system. Are you talking about a 1 million gallon elevated tank to replace Pine Mountain? You, you said that uh, 1 million gallons would do it at some kind of elevation. You didn't quite get to the bottom line of what that was. So um, good points and, and good questions. I, I think maybe to, to just start with the first point you made about nitrification. I think I threw that out as an example. I mean, that there are, clearly there are other benefits, things like disinfection byproducts that are minimized if you can minimize water age. So as a rule of thumb, it's, um, that, that's the direction the industry has gone since 2000 as well. Let's, let's, let's minimize water age, but subject to, of course, the fact that you need reliable water. And so it's a trade-off. Um, but your, your, your point about elevations, um, it, that's exactly right. And of course, the, the, I think I referred to it very much in passing about, you know, how does this fit into the system among the criteria we're looking at, system versatility. Sure. So a tank like White's Hill, I mean, a plus is that it can serve, it can serve a large parts of the system by gravity. Ross Reservoir, by contrast, can only serve Ross Valley. So, and, and so of course we're looking at all of that. It's just, a, there's only so much we, we, um, we put on the slides, maybe we should have put elevation, but that's- being, Yeah, I think in the future, it would make sense to actually put the elevation right on top of the picture, you know, whatever elevation it is. But I understand that. And um, I guess final, the, 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 how does the CP5 and CP18 fit in? They would actually not need to be elevated in their current kind of concept elevations. Right now, they're, they're approximately the same elevation as the existing Pine Mountain Tunnel. So they would provide that free surface very much similar to the tunnel itself. So uh, the, the, the ability of the tunnel to, to handle whether it surges or slower transients or flow equalization, we get all those benefits on the CP sites. Without going into any elevation Issue other than I normal tank height on stilts or anything, right? At, at approximately, or even elevation. even a narrow and tall tank, right? You don't need that, you don't think? Huh? No. Good. So, I mean, not to be too uh, obtuse about it, but CP five, CP eighteen are just the the markers. Exactly, those are the stationing markers along concrete okay. pipe road. Yeah. Okay, I'll take a look. Hi, uh, Jack, Cynthia, Monty. Where are we with the state on Pine Mountain Tunnel? Yeah. I can take that one, Ben, if you'd like. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the state are, are aware that we're moving forward, Director Gibson, with a planning effort for the system, specifically focusing on this. Uh, at the same time, as you know, we're managing the water quality in the tunnel. Uh, to make sure that that water uh, remains uh, safe and it's high quality for our customers. Yeah, I would just add to that that they're specifically um, pleased and encouraging that we're moving forward um, to replace Pine Mountain Tunnel. Good. Have we got the bats under control in Pine Mountain? Do we get them locked out or do they still have access? Um, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any bats. At the oh, moment. good, good, good. Well, that means we must have got under control. There were a family of bats or more mm -hmm. than a family. They were using it as a cave at one point in time. There was a proposal to turn it into blat, uh, to bat habitat too when it was decommissioned. But, right, I yeah. do remember that. Of course, I, I probably haven't checked with the bats on that one yet, huh? Uh, probably they will do what they wish to do huh, as long as we don't close it up too tight. One question I'd like to ask is to what degree has this analysis um, been taken into consideration what we expect is our, as, as, as any growth in demand into the future? 
has the analysis <coughs> largely focused on our current existing needs and operations, or is there any sort of projection about increased demand or or and and including you know any shift in hydrology related to climate change? Good questions. I. I I believe that the, the numbers um, for future demands, which could go up or down for various reasons, mm -hmm. are, they're, I think they're, they're actually being studied now. So we'd be able to fine tune this. Uh, you saw the sort of impact that it has. It, it, won't, it won't move the needle you know, from say 9.8 to dramatically larger or smaller. But as, as, the, as those projections are, are being um, updated over the next several months, we'll be able to fine tune our number accordingly. Yeah, Monty, a good question. Keep in mind that fire is what drives these things. It's that emergency storage. Remember the, mm -hmm. the big chunk that he showed yeah. on the graph, the 60% or something like that? that? That's what drives the size of the tank is supplying the 1500 gallons a minute at X number of hydrants for two hours or whatever the criterion is. So. You know, you, you, you've got a lot of, of give in the system. Um, and as I like to say, we, we ain't making clocks. You do like to say that. I do. <laughs> I've never heard you say that. <laughs> really? You got to listen up. You have not attention. <laughs> three time, three, every, I, think, I, think, I think right now, uh, Larry, you are three for three on the last uh, three meetings that I've been on. So <laughs> I'm going to keep tracking you here. Uh, it will probably run 100 percent by the end of the year. Okay, uh, public comment or Cynthia, you have a comment? Oh, just I, I don't want to repeat what everybody else has said. I just want to thank the staff for a really, really informative and and very well done um, uh, presentation. And I assume, as always, that will this be going up on the website? Okay, because it it was great. It was really helpful for me. Yes. Thank you. Oh, yes, we do have one uh, public comment, Larry Menikes. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, folks. Um, it seems that this should have been integrated into the 10 year planning process rather than as a separate entity here and should come back into the 10 year pr planning process. And also, um, this seems like the never ending story, doesn't it? <laughs> Talking about Pine Mountain. How many years has this been going on? And no, here's what we all can agree upon is we're going to have to move many, many hundreds of truckloads of soil. We're going to have to bring in many, many, many hundreds of yards of concrete to do this. You are going to get tremendous pushback from the aesthetic point of view. People hate tanks. They're going to continue to hate them. And what's going to be really critical here is this is a community resiliency community safety issue. And please folks stand strong because this is a, um, you know, this is permanent. This is, this is gonna go on for, for generations once these tanks are, are put into place. So put them in the best place and, and please do not compromise on this one. Do, do what is gonna be best for the community long-term. You're gonna hear, we know we're gonna hear complaints. We know it. And I just wanna, emphasize, you know, some of us are standing behind you on this one. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Uh, you know, just to comment, next time you're up American Canyon going to Napa on 29, take a look on the left-hand side on the hill. Um, CH Tomb Hill designed a tank there and they did a wonderful job. There's a dirt uh, earth berm in front of the tank and it's planted. You can hardly see the tank at all. So. There are ways of covering them up and, and bringing them more into compliance with nature. Um, and like I say, that, that's a particularly good one that uh, they put together at that location. Just FYI. But we hear you, don't worry, we'll hang in there. Got to have water storage. I, I wanted to briefly note that um, these projects are among a good number of projects that we're looking to move forward fairly quickly and the reason being, um, we wanna have some shovel ready projects because those go to the front of the line with the grant opportunities that are coming. So there's a whole number and we're gonna get a list together and we'll share it with the board of 
the projects we're strategically trying to accelerate to be most prepared for these pretty significant grant opportunities that are coming. Cool. Great. Okay. Um, looks like we can move on to uh, old number four, now number three, uh, fire flow improvement program, Monterey Avenue pipeline replacement project. Just a quick comment, Mike. I don't think I remember seeing a pipe that large, that old as Cordon Drive, 1914 four inch threaded galvanized pipe. That's probably before Bill Seeger's time, before he was born. That's a pretty old one. Trying to replace it as fast as we can. <laughs> well, I'm not sure we're accomplishing that goal, but that's all right. So Alex is gonna lead the discussion on this item. Thank you, Alex. Yes. Uh, good morning, directors. I'm Alex and I is the engineer in the design section. Uh, this morning, I'm here to present the Fire Flow Improvement Program Monterey Avenue Pipeline Replacement Project. Uh, this project is located along Monterey Avenue, Los Angeles Boulevard, uh, Mountain View Avenue, Cordon Drive, Brookside, Riviera, Beverly, and Monterey Terrace, all within the town of San Anselmo. Uh, this project will install approximately 7,200 feet of six inch pipe along with pertinences to replace the old leak prone undersized fire flow deficient pipe in support of the district's fire flow improvement program. Uh, this work will also be in coordination with the town of San Anselmo's upcoming street overlay project they got in that community. Uh, the engineer's estimate for this project is $1,630,000 and is scheduled to last 240 days with a contract completion date of February 10th, 2022. Uh, if all contract bid documents are acceptable, staff will be making a recommendation at the June 15th board meeting for a contract award. So the recommended um, staff action is for review and referral to the board with the operation committee's recommendation to proceed with this project. And, and Alex, time, I presume we plan to put a big sign on Jack Gibson's door saying, any questions <laughs> about the digging, call me. Yeah. Only if Director Gibson agrees with that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Why not? Yeah. I'll tell you though, you know, they did that work on Paradise Drive and I never got a single phone call. Yeah. And they were there for a similar length of time. And, you know, I, I just give them kudos that they are able to um, keep the, the folks under control and happy. Well, the, the possible. A good part of the success there in, in each case, and I know it's a pattern that we follow, is getting word out in advance. Uh, letting people know this is coming. And if people aren't surprised, uh, right. you generally don't have a lot of problems. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see, Jack. Yeah, we definitely will. I, I hope you're right. I, I don't want the moment to pass without noting <laughs> that we are replacing a Woodrow Wilson pipeline here. So uh, it's amazing, huh? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm very curious to see, and, and Alex, please save a chunk of that pipe so I can see it or get a good picture of it. I'm re very curious about what it looks like on the outside and on the inside. As am I as well. Yes, absolutely. We'll make sure to that one is that really old for galvanized. And, yeah. you know, it probably speaks well to our corrosion control program, not, not the external, but the internal, um, you know, but that's. I don't know about uh, old for galvanized, but but it's a fairly newcomer compared to the William McKinley pipeline I've seen replaced and the Chester A. Arthur pipelines I've seen replaced. So, <laughs> yeah, but I bet it's the oldest pipeline in San Anselmo. Uh, probably now because we've yeah. replaced the old ones. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that's pretty old. Yeah. That's a a good service life. Uh, mm -hmm. You know over a hundred years out of uh, pipe that you would expect to get 30 or so years out of. Right. Okay, um, public comment? There are none that I see, none. Okay. Um, not quite sure here. What do we need to do? Anything? Is this an action or not? Director Russell, this is just a uh, referral to the board and, and in okay. the past we either had you know, no objection to that or um, a first and a second without a vote. So you can go in, go in either direction there. You want to uh, motion to put it towards the board, Jack? I'll move approval, we submit it to the board for Second. approval. Thanks guys. Okay, now old number five, new number four, 2021 corrosion test station rehabilitation project. 
I'm taking this one as well, so I'm still here. So, uh, so I'm here to present the uh, 2021 Corrosion Test Station Rehabilitation Project. Uh, this project is located in, in multiple locations throughout the district service area, all within Marin County. Uh, the district currently maintains about 7,000 corrosion test stations throughout our distribution system that are installed to prevent corrosion damage to our pipelines. Uh, the test stations consist of 32 pound magnesium anodes, along with other uh, cathodic protection systems that help extend the service life of the pipelines by serving as sacrificial anodes. Uh, these anodes uh, gradually deplete over time and have a useful service life of about 20 years. So they need to be replaced on a certain interval. Uh, and to, so they could continue to provide corrosion protection to our water distribution system. Uh, our corrosion department has identified, uh, identified multiple corrosion test stations throughout our district uh, that are in need of replacement at this time. So the project uh, will install 121 new magnesium anodes at 105 corrosion test stations to improve uh, the cathodic protection of the water distribution system. The engineer's estimate for this project is $91,000 and is scheduled to last about 108 days with a contract completion date of October 1st, 2021 of this year. Uh, if all contract bid documents are acceptable, staff will be making a recommendation at the June 15th board meeting for a contract award. So again, the recommended staff action is for review and referral to the board with the operation committee's recommendation to proceed with the project. Uh, I have Gary Anderson and Austin Smith here to help answer any questions if anyone has any questions regarding this. Hearing none, any public comment? There are none. Okay. I'll move approval to the, send it to the board for approval. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, old number six, new number five, award of contract number 1948 for fuel break maintenance and invasive plant management. Crystal? Yeah, we've got Sean we're gonna bring into the room to present this item. There he is. Good afternoon, Director Sean Horn, um, Watershed Resources Manager. The item before you is award of contract number 1948 for fuel break maintenance and invasive plant management. Um, on May 21st, um, on May 20th, 2021, the district released a notice inviting bidders to submit a proposal for a two-year two fuel break maintenance and invasive plant management contract. This bid process is scheduled to close on May 28th, 2021, at which time the district will select the lowest responsible bidder to award the contract to. Today, staff is requesting that the operations committee review and refer this item to a future regular meeting of the board of directors to award contract number 1948 to the lowest responsible bidder and authorize the general manager to execute any and all future amendments to the contract in an amount not to exceed 10% of the contract. Now this um, contract is replacing a contract that we've been, had in place since 2017, and it's critical to maintaining our fuel break infrastructure, construct, constructing new fuel breaks on the watershed, and managing our invasive plants, specifically broom. This is a um, hand labor crew that comes onto the watershed to support our work and fuel reduction activities and is um, critical to us scaling up the biodiversity fires and fuels integrated plan. Um, just for context, our, our engineer's estimate on this is about $1,112,000 over a two year period. And then we'd be looking to extend this if they meet the, um, the, our standards of operations for this work. And then the rates for this type of work typically range somewhere between $30 an hour to $35 an hour. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions that you might have about this contract. And again, we'll be bringing back the, the contract to a full board meeting um, with the final bids for award. Hi, Sean. Did we lose ground due to COVID over the last year on this issue? Not for this type of contract work with our fuel break maintenance. No, we didn't lose ground. We were able to continue operations primarily because this was outdoor work. Um, you know, there was a slight pause in our work throughout the season, right after COVID started. But once sure. contractors started to understand how to move their crews out to the sites, we were fine. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I'm good. Public comment? There are none. Okay. Okay. Uh, move that we refer to the board for approval. Second. Thank you. Okay, yeah. item old number seven, now number six, First Amendment to contract number 1875 with West Coast Arborists. 
for yeah. tree maintenance. Again, I'll take this one. So Sean Horn, Watershed Resources Manager. Um, this is the first amendment to contract number 1875 with West Coast Arborist. Um, on May 1st, 2018, the Board of Directors approved a three-year contract with West Coast Arborist to maintain um, some of our facility sites and assist with hazardous tree removal on the watershed. This contract included an option to extend in one-year increments um, should the contractor be meeting our standards. We would like to extend this contract for another year. Um, and the new extended contract amount would be $243,756. Um, and the rates for this contract did increase in association with the CPI, which is allowed under the contract terms. Um, and this would be our final extension, I believe, for this contract and would support some really critical work that we do on the watershed to protect users and our, or our visitors um, because this contractor is specializing in tree work. So they're going out and if we have hazardous down trees during winter storms or trees over some of our, that die over our picnic areas, we'll bring this contractor in to remove or prune those trees as necessary. And then they also assist with our work around our facilities throughout the county to help us with our fuel reduction activities as well as hazardous tree removal um, work. So this is again, a continuation of a contract we've had in place and is really critical to our operations. Um, and we'd like to refer this to a future board meeting for authorization and approval. So with that, I'll take any questions you might have on the contract. I have just a sort of general question here. Um, uh, 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 generally, how do they, how much time are they out there? Are they out there continuously? Or are they out there on call or how, how does that operate? Yeah, thank you. Um, this contract is an on-call contract. This is not one of the continuous fuel reduction works. It's a higher rate because it's a more specialized contractor crew. You can think of arborists coming out and actually climbing the trees or bringing boom trucks out to do some high limbing. Um, so we have about 654 hours for tree work allocated under this contract. We do use that, but it's on incremental basis. So usually after big winter storms, we'll bring this contractor out for two weeks or so on the watershed and they'll assist with clearing down trees and addressing any hazardous conditions we might have um, incurred. And then the contract also includes about 60 hours of emergency work. So in the case of an uh, extreme emergency where we have a tree fall during a storm, we can bring them out um, to address that issue immediately. Great. How much do we spend a year on them normally? Yeah, about $243,000 is what we're moving forward with this year. I think we were more around 170,000 last fiscal year. And do they get special pay when there's a mountain lion in the tree? We haven't had that yet. Um, you know, maybe we'll see a bear in the tree in the future, but. Um, a bear, yeah, there's San Anselmo bear, he could be there, yeah, that's true. Or that San Francisco mountain lion, you know, you don't know. Sean, are we, um, are we doing preventative maintenance on hazardous trees? Yeah, so this contract also includes um, assistance with inspecting hazardous trees. So our crews are on the watershed and our facilities crews also are inspecting trees on a regular basis. And when we need additional support with that inspection, we can bring this contractor on. And that really informs how we do the pruning or the removal is their expertise. So our, our crew is identifying hazardous trees and things like yeah. that. That and our visitors, you know, we get a lot of reports from visitors right after the storms when they're the first ones on the trails regarding some condition. And then we'll send our maintenance crews out to inspect and then bring this crew in if necessary. And only when it's um, a bigger job than what our maintenance crews can take on. Good, okay. Cool. Any public comment? There are no raised hands. Okay. okay. Again, I'll refer to the board for approval. Second. Okay, thank you, Jack. Thank you, Larry. Okay, well, now we're going back to old number two, which is now number six or something like that. 2020 Urban Water Management Plan Update, Water Shortage Contingency Plan. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yep. I'm clear. See my slides? Okay, good. All right, um, good morning. Crystal Yesman, Director of System Maintenance and Natural Resources. Uh, Paul Celiana. So A and I are tag teaming on managing uh, the, um, the draft for our urban water management plan. And as you know, the urban water management plan is a regulatory requirement. Every five years, every water utility in the state of California has to submit to DWR an updated urban water management plan. And for those in the audience, the urban water management plan is designed to ensure that a water utility takes a hard look at their water supply portfolio and the reliability of meeting future projected water demand. 
Um, the water shortage contingency plan is a component of the urban water management plan. And this describes how the district intends to act in the case of any water shortage condition with predetermined steps. Now, today's drought conditions are unprecedented. And as you know, it's the lowest two year rainfall in 143 years. Uh, we're learning a lot. And um, the water shortage contingency plan that I'm going to present today has been informed by what we've worked through over the last few months. We've been closely monitoring our reservoir levels and we're, we are reacting to current events, making operational changes, taking water shortage response actions and analyzing the, the efficacy of our conservation mandates. The verdict is still out as to what actions have the most impact on reducing water demand. But with all of that in place, we still have to submit the urban water management plan by the end of June. It's a regulatory requirement. And if we fail to meet that deadline, our grant funding could be stalled impacting revenues. That's the hammer that the state has in regards to enforcement of deadlines for urban water management plans. Uh, you will find that we have tried to take today's water shortage actions and describe them without specificity so that we do not tie our hands, yet we meet the regulatory requirement to submit the urban water management plan by June 30th. For example, you'll see shortage response actions such as restrict irrigation or restrict irrigation further, but we're, we aren't necessar necessarily dictating what that looks like in terms of number of days. Um, so the guidelines for the urban water management plan were designed so that a water shortage contingency plan can be updated at any time. It's not tied to the five-year submittal. It is gonna be attached as an appendix to the urban water management plan. And staff plans on bringing it back to the board following this drought to codify and specify some of the actions we deemed appropriate. So this is uh, the key milestones in developing the urban water management plan. We came back, we came to the board back in February with our demand analysis. And that showed that by the year 2045, we expect demands to reach about 27,000 acre feet. This is not much different from today's demands, but that was a component that was required under the urban water management plan efforts. Then we came to the board in April with our water supply assessment. Uh, that was a looking at the reliability of our current water supply based on historical weather patterns. Um, and so to, and to meet future demand projections. Now, looking at past weather events, we can weather the storm or the lack thereof, and we have enough water to meet demand. This is when you look at past weather, historical weather patterns. But a new component of the urban water management plan is the drought risk assessment, which we presented in April. And that what we did there is we forecasted theoretical drought conditions, in which case we can force the water supply shortfall that we would see under extreme drought projections. And as we can see from our current drought, these theoret theoretical drought conditions may actually come to reality one day. Um, so today we're presenting the water shortage contingency plan. And these are the chapters that are in uh, the urban water management plan. We're, we're in the home stretch now. Water shortage contingency plan is today's presentation. So uh, today I'm gonna go over the key elements that were required uh, by regulation to be included in the water shortage con contingency plan. And those include six standard water shortage stages or triggers. Um, we're required to have six. Uh, there's the, we are required to describe the actions that we will take under each condition, uh, talk about compliance and enforcement, um, and then how we update and revise the document. And we'll talk about next steps. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the water shortage contingency plan describes how the district intends to act in the case of any water shortage condition with predetermined steps. And uh, there's the six triggers, there's the actions, and then also there's a, uh, a new requirement where every year starting next year on July 1st, we will have to submit to the board, uh, to the Department of Water Resources, a water shortage assessment report um, and that has to be submitted every year starting next year. So it's basically a state of the union as to where we stand um, each year in terms of water supply. Mm -hmm. So you've seen this slide before at our drought updates. These are our current triggers and our future water supply projections. Right now we have three triggers. Um, mandatory rationing, if the, um, this is on the books, by the way, 
um, December 1st if it's below 30,000 acre feet. And as you know, we are projected to be below 30,000 acre feet, even with, this is with conservation in place. If we get um, uh, average rainfall, um, even next year, we'd be still looking at one of these triggers, which is voluntary rationing. If we're below 50,000 acre feet on April 1st, and then it, it gets a little more, if it's less, if we didn't get enough rain, it, there's a little bit stronger rationing requirements. Now, these are the triggers that are currently on the books. So let's look at the new triggers that we've worked out internally here at the district. These are required six triggers. We have normal conservation. Uh, there's no actual shortage condition. But trigger one, stage one, is if we have low rainfall. And I'm going to go into more detail on, in a graphic moment overlaid with those projections. But uh, we're setting trigger one as if rainfall is 30% below average for the water year as April 1st. That means if we've gotten less than 32 inches of rain between October and March. Now this is only, this has happened this year and it happened last year. Prior to that, it had happened in 2014. And the, prior to that, the only time it happened, well, it happened uh, prior to that in 1994. So in 27 years, um, we really only hit this trigger for low rainfall four times. And so we're, we would say that if we're getting low rainfall, you know that the um, runoff is gonna be less. You know, we just wanna be on, a, on alert and ask for folks to conserve a little bit more than they normally do, up to 10%. The next trigger is if reservoir storage is in the vicinity of 45,000 acre feet on January 1st. This is earlier trigger than we've had before. We also, as we get further on into the, uh, the rain year there, and it's in February, we expect it's raining in January or February. So we want the storage levels to actually increase at that time. So if the reservoir storage hasn't increased to at least 50,000 acre feet by February 1st, we're now in alert. Moving on, stage four, if the storage is in the vicinity of 55,000 acre feet on April 30th, or the projection is that it's not gonna rain and we're gonna have low um, reservoir levels by December 1st if we don't, uh, if it's unconstrained demand, um, then we're in stage four. And actually that's where we find ourselves today. We are currently on stage four. And the next stage is five, is if we hit December 1st, it still hasn't started raining and the reservoir levels are 30,000 acre feet or less. And then stage six is if it continues to drop and it still hasn't rained. So that would be a third year of drought. So let's overlay these triggers on that, that, those water um, supply levels. So looking back in the year 2020, uh, these are the, the triggers here, these, these diamonds, but this is the low rain, rainfall trigger on April 1st. We would just, if there's, we, we were, um, 30% below average rainfall back in April of 2020. So we would have met that. And we met it again, actually, in April of this year. As we move through the year, um, on January 1st, we were right at what we call stage two. We had about 45,000 acre feet on January 1st of this past, past January. And then as soon as we hit February 1st, we would have been in stage three, this new trigger. And we actually did take action in February. As you know, we started to get worried and we, we um, uh, preemptively declared a drought. Mm -hmm. And now today we're at stage four um, where we're well below what we should be at in terms of reservoir levels. Now looking ahead in terms of demands, these are unconstrained what? demands. If we get, uh, even if we get average rainfall starting in November of this year, we're probably gonna hit stage, stage five. The projection is that we're gonna be less than 30,000 acre feet on December 1st. We will be in critical deficit. If, if, even if we get average rainfall, we're gonna continue to be below these triggers. So that means even with average rainfall looking ahead, we're still gonna be asking folks to conserve and those and it might not even be an ask, it might be a mandate. So this is just projecting ahead. We would have to get above average rainfall to recover from this drought this coming winter. 
Now, of course, if it still doesn't rain and we keep dropping, dropping below average rainfall, we're now in an oops, in, a, in stage six emergency. Okay, so the next step of the water shortage contingency plan is the actions. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how we've described those actions in the plan. Um, there's uh, water use restrictions, there's operational changes and supply augmentation. And then we, we speak, the document speaks on financial impacts and actions in a general, in a general way as required by regulations. So our standard uh, water use um, restrictions uh, which are normal water conservation measures. Uh, and I'm not going to read through all of these, but these are, our, our, what are typically we ask of customers on a day-to-day -day basis, regardless of drought condition. <clears throat> that would be under stages one and two. These are the voluntary conservation. We're asking people to really pay attention to the conservation actions that they can take. <clears throat> Stage three, which is um, February, the reservoir levels are rather low. Um, then we're going to put into our water shortage contingency plan that we will increase restrictions on irrigation. Now we're not specifying whether it's two days or three days or spray or drip. We're making a suggestion in the plan, but we don't want to tie our hands to any any action um, because we're still working it out through this this current situation. But we did put into the document, you know, we're going to ask people to cover their pools, everything that we've actually. Uh, enacted just recently is, is here. Um, increase our incentives for water conservation, et cetera. Now stage four, where we find ourselves today, um, the restrictions become more strict. And, um, and so this is actions that we would take in April, end of April, um, to get a little bit more strict on the water use restrictions. Uh, we would at this point we start to consider implementation of drought rates and water surcharges. We're not saying enact them that early in, in May, but um, start thinking about it. <clears throat> and we're beginning our discussions on limiting or excluding new service connections during a drought, as you know. Okay, stage five, which is in December, if it still hasn't started raining. Again, increase restrictions on irrigation. I mean, are, are we going to be mandating that? People can only water trees, you know, no drip or spray. So um, we're again, we're not having being specific. We're just saying increase the restriction. Uh, we might want to increase restrictions on pools because um, now we don't have, we only have, we have less than 30,000 acre feet. And as you know, that's not enough to meet our annual demand. Uh, new water service connections, we might get more strict on um, on uh, moratoriums on water service connections. And at this point, we would be probably enacting drought rates and water surcharges on stage five by December. Actually, the studies have shown through AWWA that the most effective means of reducing water demand is through drought rates and surcharges. That, that there was some um, studies, case studies um, conducted throughout uh, the United States. Um, additional mandatory measures at, on stage six is, you know, now we're really running dry. The reservoirs are, are, are going to be uh, used up. And so we might impose water allotments. Uh, we, would, we would state that potable water is only used, can only be used for human health and safety. And we will not, absolutely not grant new water service connections. So that's really, that's the bottom of the barrel there. Okay, so what are some of the supply augmentations that we describe in the plan? Uh, we talk about increasing supplemental water imports. We think we can get up to five additional 5,000 acre feet. And it's of course dependent on hydraulic capabilities. That's Castania pump station and our ability to bring that water in and the timing. Uh, we can enact dry year stream release flow reductions. This is under our water rights order. It allows us to reduce the amount of base flow that we have in the creeks on dry years. Uh, we would also initiate our study for the temporary change position, which we're doing now. Here we are on stage four, shortage level stage four. We're doing that now. We think we could probably get up to 2,500 acre feet, um, but we're still you know, determining whether or not there'd be negative impact to the, to the habitat. Uh, on stage five in December, if we're really low, 
Um, we can access stored emergency supply, about 800, 500 acre feet. We have about, we have that much water, we think in Alpine, Dam, Alpine Lake that we can't get right now. Uh, we, there's options to try to, to get that last little bit of water out of Alpine Lake. One is to um, extend the suction pipeline on the pumps that pump water from Alpine up to Bon Tempe, or to open the scour valves at Alpine Dam and dump it down into Kent Lake. There's some action, there's some some efforts we can take in order to access a little bit more water out of Alpine Lake. And then of course, as you know, we're looking at all sorts of emergency water supply projects right now. Water transfers, um, groundwater banking, desal, it's unknown. We're investigating all of these options as I speak. Uh, operational changes that we describe in the plan um, on stage two, on the different trigger levels. We're minimizing system flushing to focus only on water quality. As you get into stage three, we're going to only do line flushing for regulatory compliance actions, such as disinfection or water quality violations. We'll start to access our stored emergency supply. That means uh, transferring water from Phoenix to Bon Tempe, which we did through February um, and March. Uh, we'll initiate water waste patrols, start looking for leaks, um, increase the leak repairs to prioritize the, the repair of leaks. Well, at stage four, which we find ourselves today, we're, we're accessing additional stored emergency supply. We're renting the generators and the pump or to move water from Sula Hule to Nicasio. And as you know, that's a very expensive in Denver and millions of dollars to, to move that water so that we can use it. Uh, we'll start increasing water waste repuls, patrols even more and increase uh, system leak repair. As we actually are moving crews right now from um, other parts of our agency to help get leaks repaired um, sooner. Mm -hmm. um, now, there is a component of the water shortage contingency plan where we go into detail about our communications efforts. And I'm not going to present that today as we just had a, a communications meeting last uh, this week and we went into detail on what we're doing in terms of communications. So there is a section in the plan on financial impacts. We discuss revenue reductions and expenses that are increasing from uh, demand reductions, water conservation incentives, public outreach, water waste patrols, the staff resources that we're dedicating to those efforts emergency water transfers and for generator and fuels. And then how are we gonna, how are we gonna mitigate the loss in revenue? So we'll utilize our reserves, as you know, and then as we move forward, we'll start discussing temporary drought rates and water use surcharges. Uh, one part of the uh, document is a description of our compliance and enforcement actions. And this slide summarizes what we've enacted for fines for the new conservation mandates. Um, we have ways for folks to call in and, and report a leak. Um, we're analyzing water bills and we're, we're putting out customer notices. We're monitoring real-time flows through our AMI meters. Um, and as you know, we have first notice of warning violations, $25, repeat violations, 250. All of that is described in the water shortage contingency plan. And of course, we also talk about the variance and exception process, exemption process for financial hardships or for self, health and safety reasons, or um, for if somebody has an alternative means of compliance on reducing their water demand. All right, so updates and revisions. Uh, rather than every five years as required by the Urban Water Management Plan, the shortage contingency plan can be amended and resubmitted to DWR at any time. Uh, it just, and we have a section in there that describes the district's reevaluation and improvement process to assess the functionality of the plan and to make appropriate adjustments. And our intent is to relook at it um, following the current drought conditions. So next steps, um, we're putting together the, the public draft for, um, to be distributed for folks to take a look at it by the end of May. And then June, the June 15th uh, board meeting, we're, we're hoping to have the public hearing and adoption of the urban water managed plan so that we can meet the June 30th uh, deadline. All right, with that, that's the end of the presentation. I'll uh, see if you guys have any questions.
Uh, Crystal, the new urban water management plan includes the drought shortage section, or is that a separate standalone document? The drought risk assessment is uh, part of the water supply reliability assessment chapter, which is chapter seven. Um, we, we talked about that at our April um, presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trying to figure out how to stop my share here. Excuse me. Did I lose you? No. No, you just stopped sharing. So. I did. Okay, good. Thank you, whoever did that. <laughs> Any other questions? I'd just like to say that was a very great presentation. Chris. That was very good. Yeah. Um, Chris, um, the, the well, other I'm, I'm a little worried. Go ahead. I'm a little worried about it in terms of, uh, of the consequences, but um, it was a great presentation. Go ahead, Larry. Uh, how was the future um, water demand calculated? We used uh, ABAG numbers for population growth, and um, we actually collaborated with our regional partners so that we had um, similar methodology for projecting future demands. Um, but it really, it's based on ABAG numbers for population growth. And does it include the new ABAG um, uh, housing, the RENA numbers? Uh, I believe so, yes. Because, you know, the new RENA number is something like 14,000 new units in Marin. So that's about a 25% increase in uh, our total customer base. So just wondering how 27,000 acre feet is derived from those kind of numbers. Right. Well, it also okay. includes uh, passive um, conservation. So that's embedded in the good in the methodology. So um, is that is that going to be included in the report? I mean, I can just take. Oh yeah, there's a very thorough um, section on demand analysis and how it was forecasted. Yeah, yes. I mean, I just I just don't know whether you know that is a sustainable yield, you know. So. My understanding, and, and Crystal, I know this isn't our expertise, but my understanding is that the part of the assumptions about the new um, housing is that it's going to be very, very low water intensive because most of it's planned to be multifamily. So it, the it, this, it, as it's been explained to me in the past, the idea is that there would be um, a, a very, very small water footprint um, relative to past population increases or housing increases because um, there would be so little outdoor landscaping um, associated with some of that new development. And also, I don't know if this, this is part of the, the, the thinking, but as, as we are now considering, we are in a position to require um, um, significant new developments to be um, net zero water. So yeah, it, there's, there's been in most Western communities a break between an increase in population and an increase in water use for that and, and other reasons. So we're, we're seeing that those, those numbers that have been in the past been considered very aligned, they're now disaggregated, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. See, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think that this is, uh, this is worth drilling in on um, because it is just, it, it's, a, it's a conversation that is front and center. And uh, you know, at a minimum, we wanna know and be able to express that we've planned for the future with, with some level of growth assumed into it um, and, and explain how, how that works out and why it's different than the past. Because I think that that's, you know, folks, um, the concerned public doesn't understand how future development will not look like the past. And Right, I think that's right. And I think part of that, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, sorry. Were you okay. done, Monty? Yes. I, I think the other thing, and then I, I, I have to go, I have a hard stop in just a couple of minutes, but I think the other thing that would be useful here, and I know this is outside of the requirements of the urban water plan, but I think it would be useful for us to look back at our past projections, which in my recollection, which it may be imperfect, um, were way high. I mean, the one that I remember from when Larry Russell and I first started at the board, we were projected to be at 36,000 acre feet of demand um, by this time. And that's obviously far off. So I think for purposes of doing just what 
Monty suggested, which is, you know, tell the story to the public. I think it's useful to say, these are the projections that we've had in the past over the last 20, 25 years. And here's where we have been accurate. And here's where we've missed the mark, you know, where our expectations about water use efficiency and, you know, um, the community response to, uh, you know, drought and other, you know, um, uh, well, I don't want to say unexpected, but but you know other contingencies. You know how you know our forecasts, which we nobody expects them to be perfect. It's not a criticism, but I think it would be help tell the story to see where we've been. And as I know, all of you are, you know, are hearing over and over again all of your your work on this. The past simply is no longer prologue. It just isn't. I mean, this is something Director Russell has said over and over again. You know, given climate change and given changing. Um, you know, understanding about how to use water, given changing views about the role of water use efficiency as supply, um, you know, just because something has been the, the, we've, the way we've done it for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years does not mean we should be assuming that going forward. And I think that's a story that that's easier to tell if we go back and say, you know, here's what we projected, you know, in the last 20, 15, 10 years ago. Does that, does that make sense to people? Yeah, that's a good point, Cynthia. I would even add to that, that you just as you said, it's an important story to tell. I, I would really encourage us to tell that story um, because it's very relevant to to the current drought that we're in. It's very relevant to, again, the concerns about future growth and how we're managing managing and planning for the future. So I would I would encourage that we've got this all this all these new analyses, all this new thinking that is going into this plan that we find some way to tell it in a more concise and and publicly accessible form. Um, so that we can share that with folks, because it's a, it's a very, very important story that we need to be telling um, and, and be able to respond to people who, who uh, you know, at this point, it seems like it's a very regular occurrence with many of our meetings to have people who are expressing concerns to be able to have a piece that we can send to them and say, you know, here is, you know, we, we'd be happy to send this to you. There's a lot behind how we are responding to the future you know, please take a look at this and then we're happy to talk more. But that way we're not trying to um, address this conversation in detail at every board meeting because it's it, it's very hard. It's, it takes time to be able to explain. I, yeah, we I, have some really great graphics that show historical and future projections that, you know, are embedded in, you know, very technical analyses. And I agree, we should probably take those out and make them avail more readily available um, for the public to see. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I have to go. I'm so sorry. I need to sign off. Have a great day and a great weekend, everybody. Bye. Thank and you. this was really so, helpful. Crystal, when when is when are you gonna be ready to publish? Uh, well, we're wrapping up the review of the document right now, and so we're hoping to publish it by the end of the month. Um, okay. And you, the board will be copied, or we'll get a link or something. Oh yeah, you're gonna get your own printed copy. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any public comment? There are none. Okay. Well, with that, we're ready to adjourn. Thank you all. Okay. Thanks. Thank so you. Weekend, See you. Yeah, everybody have a good weekend. You too. Bye-bye.